Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Humanities Forum. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the director of the Humanities Forum. Uh, the Humanities Forum exists to provide a space, regular space, on most Friday afternoons during the academic year where we can come together as a community and reflect on some of the deepest human things. It's really uh, my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's special guest, Professor John Schwenkler, a professor of philosophy at Florida State University. He studied philosophy at the Catholic University of America uh, with, among others, our former president, uh, Father Brian Shanley, and the University of Notre Dame, where I'm happy to say he spent a long summer afternoon explaining to me once the mad genius of Kant's first critique. Before receiving his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 2009. Today he comes to us from the University of Notre Dame where he is spending the year as a visiting faculty fellow in the Institute for Advanced Study. After returning to the Sunshine State, he will also divide his time over the next two years between Germany and Florida. In Germany, he'll be a Humboldt visiting researcher at the University of Leipzig. His research focuses on philosophical psychology, including topics in the philosophy of mind, philosophy of action, epistemology, philosophy of language, and experimental philosophy. And he's recently pursued graduate work in psychology, supported by an academic cross-training fellowship from the John Templeton Foundation. He's written widely for academic as well as popular publications, and most relevant for us today, has a special interest in the remarkable English Catholic philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. His recent book, Anscombe's Intention, a Guide, published with Oxford University Press in 2019, is a superb consideration of the foundational texts in the philosophy of action. But if you aren't yet ready to share in those heady philosophical waters, I warmly recommend his long essay on Anscombe's life and philosophical thought for Commonweal Magazine, entitled Untempted by the Consequences. At the heart of Anscombe's work and at the heart of Professor Schwenkler's work, is the conviction that if we would think clearly about the most important moral questions we face as human beings, is it ever permissible, for example, to kill a few in order to save many? We need to reflect very carefully on the relationship between thought and action, the connection between our interior psychological life and the world in which we live. We'd be hard pressed to find a more incisive guide to these problems than Elizabeth Anscombe in the 20th century, and dare I say, John Schwenkler in the 21st. His topic for us today is Doing the Truth, G.E.M. Anscombe and the Atomic Bomb. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Schwenkler. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation, um, and thanks for being here. Um, it really is a, a pleasure. Um, there were a few things I was going to say by way of introduction, and I've forgotten what they are. Give the talk. The women are up to something in convocation. The dons of St. John's College, Oxford, were warned. We have to go and vote them down. The women at issue were led by a young philosopher named G.E.M. Elizabeth Anscombe, who was then a tutor at Somerville, one of the oldest women's colleges at the University of Oxford. Anscombe had come to Somerville in 1946 on a research fellowship. At that time, she was a student of Ludwig Wittgenstein who entrusted her with the translation of his philosophical investigations, which appeared in 1953, two years after his death. Now, in 1956, Anscombe was opposing the university's decision to grant an honorary degree to former US President Harry Truman. Speaking on the floor of convocation to her colleagues on May 1st, 1956, Anscombe said that her opposition to granting Truman's degree was based on his responsibility for dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
1945. If you do give this honor, she asked, what Nero, what Genghis Khan, what Hitler, or what Stalin will not be honored in the future? In response, a representative of the Hebdomadal Council, then the university's chief executive body, argued that Anscombe had overstated Truman's responsibility. A great many people were involved in the responsibility of the manufacture and delivery of the bomb, he told the faculty. And we cannot select one man as being solely responsible, even if his was the signature at the bottom of the order for the bomb to be dropped. Anscombe's cause was doomed to fail. Reports in the Manchester Guardian and the Times of London claimed that no other faculty echoed her dissenting vote, though subsequent reports indicate that maybe three or four had joined her. And Anscombe later dedicated the pamphlet Mr. Truman's Degree, in which she explained the rationale for her opposition, quote, with respect but without permission to the others who said non placet. In the speech she gave to her colleagues on the day of the vote, she acknowledged that these voices were not going to prevail, saying that she had, quote, no ambition or hope to carry the house with me in this, but my hope is that this honorary degree will not be offered without opposition being expressed. Truman received his degree at the university's Enkinea ceremony on June 20th, 1956. In a speech awarding the degree, the chancellor praised him as, quote, most staunch of allies, direct in your speech and in your writings, and ever a pattern of simple courage. Anscombe, who had concluded her pamphlet with the warning that she herself should fear to go to Enkinea in case God's patience suddenly ends, had kept away from the ceremony, telling the guardian that she would spend the day working as usual. The protest against Truman was hardly Elizabeth Anscombe's first foray into public controversy. As an undergraduate in 1939, just a year after entering the Catholic Church under the tutelage of the Dominican friars at Oxford, Anscombe and her friend Norman Daniel published a pamphlet titled The Justice of the Present War Examined, a criticism based on traditional Catholic principles and on natural reason. I'm gonna to try to stay on script, but I'm gonna come off for, for one moment, or to say two things. One is, so this is 1939, they published this pamphlet. She's 20 years old and a college undergraduate. Second bit, second bit of background, this was the thing I was going to say at the beginning. A lot of these slides have material that is mine from the archive of Anscombe's papers at the University of Pennsylvania. So it's often my scans of this material, whether her correspondence or her notebooks, or in some cases, original copies of her publication, of which this is one. Anscombe and Daniels's pamphlet presented, quote, the results achieved in a series of open discussions held at Oxford, both before and after Britain's declaration of war against Nazi Germany in September of that year. Anscombe and Daniel concluded that the war against Germany was unjust, partly because it would involve the deliberate massacre of civilian populations. We have it, they wrote, following Thomas Aquinas, that no one may be deliberately attacked in war unless his actions constitute an attack on the rights which are being defended or restored. To deny this will be to assert that we may attack anyone, anywhere, whose life in any way hinders the prosecution of the war or in any way assists our enemies. And such a conclusion is as immoral as to be a reductio ad absurdum in itself. Now, Anscombe and Daniel's pamphlet of 1939 did not receive anything like the attention of her protest against Truman 17 years later, which was picked up by the Associated Press and covered in newspapers across the United States and in other parts of the world. Several of these reports, including one from Reuters um, here and one from the AP here under the headline, the Reuters one has this great headline, 
woman Don fails to halt Oxford degree to Truman, you'll notice that these reports mistakenly give her first name as Gladys rather than Gertrude. Their pamphlet did, however, apparently make enough of an impact that in 1940, the Archbishop of Birmingham wrote to a priest at Oxford complaining that Anscombe and Daniels, quote, had their pamphlet printed and brought out without submitting it to ecclesiastical authority and inquiring as to whether they were, quote, deliberately taking a line opposed to that of the hierarchy of this country. Well, whatever the position of the British hierarchy, and despite the need for some sort of military action against Nazi Germany, Anscombe and Daniel were clearly right on two very important points. First, the war that Britain actually waged against the Axis powers did involve attacks that were targeted directly at civilian populations. And second, a war carried out by such means does violate a principle, a central principle of the church's just war teaching. It is possible that the war could have been fought without deploying these tactics, and it might have been just if it had been. But Anscombe and Daniels were correct in predicting that it would not be waged in that way. Acknowledging that, quote, to some their arguments may seem temerarious, they aimed in their pamphlet to make the Christian tradition clear, to examine the mind of the church in a rational and scientific manner. Now, while Anscombe and Daniels' 1939 pamphlet was addressed exclusively to fellow Catholics and Christians, Her protest of 1956 at Oxford had a quite different audience. Indeed, in writing her pamphlet, Mr. Truman's Degree, Anscombe saw that many of her Oxford colleagues were prepared to accept a conclusion that she and Daniel had presented as a reductio ad absurdum. These philosophers endorsed a doctrine that Anscombe came to call consequentialism, a doctrine according to which there are no kinds of action such as murder, rape, torture, and adultery, for example, that any person is prohibited from doing regardless of the situation he or she is in. According to this doctrine, it can be right to attack anyone, anywhere, as long as the balance of the consequences speaks strongly enough in favor of it. Faced with a group that found this conclusion acceptable, Anscombe needed to try a different tack. Now, the closing pamphlet, the closing paragraphs of Anscombe's pamphlet, Mr. Truman's Degree, raised the question of why so many Oxford people are willing to flatter a man who had approved the massacre of entire cities. I get some small light on this subject, Anscombe wrote, when I consider the productions of Oxford moral philosophy since the First World War, which I have lately had occasion to read. One important strand that Anscombe identified in these philosophers was what she called a doctrine that it is impossible to have any quite general moral laws. According to this doctrine, such laws as it is wrong to lie or never commit sodomy are rules of thumb, which an experienced person knows when to break. Further, both his selection of these as the rules on which to proceed and his tactful adjustments of them in particular cases are based on their fitting together with the way of life, which is his preference. These philosophies then contain a repudiation of the idea that any class of actions, such as murder, may be absolutely excluded. This, again, is what Anscombe would call the consequentialist doctrine, that any type of action can in principle be justified by considering its likely consequences. According to this logic, it was because his action ended up saving lives by bringing an earlier end to the war that Truman was justified in massacring the citizens of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In modern moral philosophy, her extremely influential paper of 1958, where the term consequentialism was coined, Anscombe went to greater length in identifying the error that her Oxford colleagues had committed. This paper followed a BBC radio address from about a year earlier in which Anscombe posed the question, does Oxford moral philosophy corrupt youth? And answered no on the grounds that the youth were corrupted already and the Oxford philosophers were only telling them the things they anyway believed. 
Anscombe's paper of 1958 began with a whirlwind history in which she dismissed a series of moral philosophers from David Hume, whom she called sophistical, to Immanuel Kant, whom she called his work useless, to John Stuart Mill, whom she called stupid, to Henry Sidgwick, whom she called dull and vulgar, before moving on to take aim at the shallow, provincial, and corrupt work of her contemporaries. The latter criticism centered on a conception of intentional action that Anscombe located in the work of Sidgwick, according to which a person must be said to intend any foreseen consequences of their voluntary action. On Anscombe's reading, Sidgwick and those who followed him used this definition to put forward an ethical thesis which would now be accepted by many people. The thesis that it does not make any difference to a man's responsibility for something that he foresaw, that he felt no desire for it, either as an end or as a means to an end. Now, Anscombe illustrated the upshot of this thesis with a simple example. According to a view like Sidgwick's, there is no difference between the responsibility a man has for withdrawing material support from his children if he does this in order to achieve some further end and the responsibility the same man would have if he was imprisoned for refusing to, to commit a, a disgraceful act. In both cases, the man foresees that his choice will have the consequence of making his children poor. Therefore, according to Sidgwick's view, in each case, the man is responsible in the same way for bringing about this outcome. Now, it's straightforward to extend this analysis to Truman's decision to bomb the Japanese cities. Truman could foresee that his decision would lead to the deaths of thousands of innocent civilians. Yet, his defenders claim a similar or greater number of civilians would have been killed had he chosen not to drop the bombs. On this analysis, Truman would have been equally responsible for the civilian deaths in either case. And so the only thing that matters is whether he made the choice that led to better consequences overall. That is, to fewer total Anscombe went on to note in modern moral philosophy how surprising it was that none of the philosophers who accepted this position displayed any awareness of how their conclusions were quite incompatible with the Hebrew Christian ethic. According to this ethic, she wrote, there are certain things forbidden whatever consequences threaten. And faced with the possibility of doing these things, you are not to be tempted by fear or hope of consequences. She saw, however, that in her context, she could not respond to this situation simply by defending traditional moral absolutes. Instead, she wrote, the way forward was to begin by banishing ethics totally from our minds in order to consider simply as part of the philosophy of psychology the concepts that ethical thinking presupposes. Among these concepts, she listed action, intention, and wanting, all of which are explored in detail in the short book she had published a year earlier under the simple title, Intention. Anscombe's Intention is an extraordinarily dense and difficult book, even by the standards of contemporary philosophy. It's 94 pages long, comprising 52 numbered sections that range in length from a single paragraph to about four or five pages. In this space, the book treats an exhausting range of topics, and yet it has no obvious structure, no theses introduced at the beginning or stated clearly at the end, and barely any reference to the authors whose work it engages. It baffled several reviewers when it first appeared, and for a while went out of print. Yet when Harvard University Press reissued Anscombe's book in 2001, the following quotation from the philosopher Donald Davidson appeared on the cover. Anscombe's intention is the most important treatment of action since Aristotle. Due to its scope and style, intention resists easy summary. Anscombe is opposed throughout the book to thinking of intention primarily as a matter of one's internal psychology as the objective one has in doing a certain thing, or the willing to do a certain thing on a certain occasion. At one point, she identifies Wittgenstein as having advanced such a view 
in his Tractatus. The world is independent of my will, Wittgenstein wrote. And so any action depends on an assumed physical connection between one's inner will and one's outer bodily movements. Because of this, he continues, if there is a value which is of value, it must lie outside all happening and being so, for all happening and being so is accidental. The discussion concludes, of the will as the bearer of the ethical, we cannot speak, and the will as a phenomenon is of interest only to psychology. In an entry in one of her notebooks that likely dates to the 1950s, Anscombe cited this passage and wrote a feeling, you got used to her handwriting, more certain that there is a mistake here than about anything else in the Tractatus. She continued, I wish to say that I do what happens when I act. The extraordinary thing is that this assumes an air of paradox. The quoted remark reappears in the text of Intention, where Anscombe wrote that, quote, although everyone who heard this formula found it extremely paradoxical, in fact, it can be given good sense. So in order to save this remark from paradox, Anscombe argued in her book that we use the concept of intention to describe what happens in most of our ordinary ways of describing human and animal life. Imagine, for example, that you come into Anscombe's study and find her sitting at her desk with a pen in her hand that she's moving across the page. What is she doing? Writing, you will answer. And in, and in describing her movements in this way, you have already gone beyond a description in terms of physical bodies and forces. Mere physical objects can shatter, rise, and roll down hills, but they cannot write, jump, or walk. To describe someone's movements with words like these is to describe their movement as the execution of an intention. In a famous example that, that she explores at length in her book, Anscombe presents the case of a man who is involved in a murderous plot to kill off a group of Nazi party leaders by poisoning the water supply of their house. The way to do this is by sending poisoned water to the house water supply by means of a pump that the man is operating. And Anscombe suggests that in this case, the content of the man's intention will be displayed in his answers to a series of questions about why he is acting as he is. For example, why are you moving your arms up and down? Well, I'm operating this pump here. And what are you doing with the pump? I'm sending poisoned water into the supply of that house. And why are you poisoning the house water supply? I'm going to poison the people who live there. Why do you want those people to be poisoned? Well, because they're a bad lot, you see, and we need to kill them off in order to secure a better life for their people. In this exchange, the series of descriptions operating the pump Sending poisoned water to the house water supply, poisoning the people who live in the house, killing the people off, is revealed to be what connects what the man is doing immediately and in a way most visibly, i.e. moving his arms up and down, with the ultimate aim or objective with which he is acting, the aim of securing a better life for the people currently under the party leader's rule. Further, while only this last description gives the final or ultimate end for the sake of which the man is acting, each description is of an end in terms of which some of what the man is doing needs to be understood. He is operating the pump by moving his arms and so that the water supply of the house will be poisoned. He's doing all of this in order to poison the inhabitants of the house and thereby bring about his death. As such, the poisoning and death of these men is no merely incidental part of the story of what is happening. It is rather the means that the man has chosen of bringing about what he desires. 
Further, and this point is crucial given what I said earlier, in describing the man's intentions in this way, we make no appeal to interior events like Cartesian or Wittgensteinian acts of will. Our description of the man as sending poison to the water supply in order to poison the inhabitants and thereby kill them off is itself a description of the man's intentions in acting, but not because it describes the state of his mind rather than something that is happening in the world. Instead, Anscombe writes, it is a description that gives the order that is there in the world as the man carries out his murderous plan. This order is a kind of order that can be there only because of the existence of human agents who can formulate and express complex plans. But that does not make the order something mental or interior any more than Anscombe's inability to write without thinking means that her writing is itself an interior act. How does this account apply to the case of Truman? I have identified two ways of thinking about intention that Anscombe wants to help us resist. One, which is suggested by the remarks of Wittgenstein that I quoted shortly earlier, identifies intention with an interior act that is the cause of outward bodily movements. This kind of position naturally tends toward an, an identification of a person's intention with their final aim or objective in acting, and invites the idea that the content of a person's intention can be settled through an inner declaration, maybe of the form, well, what I really mean to be doing is ending the war with the least loss of civilian life possible. As it happens, ideas like this one got a significant hearing among mid-century Catholic theologians. And they are, I think, in line with, me, with what many of us may have been taught growing up about the need for full consent in order to commit mortal sin. Anscombe makes short work of this kind of position and intention, arguing that concerning any inner declaration of this kind, we could ask why it was performed. And since the answer to this question could be, well, she said it so that she didn't have to feel guilty about what she was doing, we see that the content of this declaration can't itself be what settles the intention with which the agent performed the relevant act. The other view of intention that Anscombe wants us to resist is the one she traces to Sidgwick. The, 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 the account that says Truman would have been no less responsible and responsible in the same way for civilian deaths that he could have foreseen as a consequence of his decision not to drop the bomb as for those he brought about deliberately by bombing the Japanese cities. To refute this latter idea, Anscombe has us imagine a variant of her case of the man pumping water, in which the man is a gardener who operates the pump as part of his usual daily job. If the man knows that on this particular occasion the water he is pumping has been poisoned, then while, and this point is important, this will not absolve him from guilt of murder, Anscombe writes. It's never the, it nevertheless makes sense to think that his intention isn't to bring about the death of the people who will drink the poisoned water. His intention is only to earn his pay. Again, however, that difference isn't settled by any inner act in which the man happens to engage. It's rather a matter of the means and order that his bodily movements themselves embody. Applied to the case at issue, Anscombe's central claim is that any honest and informative description of what Truman did must include the fact that the deaths of the Japanese civilians were a means to his end. Why are you signing your name at the bottom of that piece of paper to order that bombs be dropped? Why are you ordering those bombs be dropped? in order to end the war. How is dropping those bombs going to be a way of ending the war? Because they'll kill the people in the cities who live there and so terrorize the government into um, withdrawing, right? These deaths were not merely incidental, since it was by 
killing the civilians that Truman aimed, that Truman aimed to bring the war to a close. And the same would not have been true of deaths that he merely foresaw. Truman had innocent people killed in order to achieve his further aims. To do such a thing is to commit an act of murder. But isn't this just what Truman had to do? If not for the bombing of the Japanese cities, the war would have continued on for much longer, perhaps with the consequence of more civilian deaths than resulted from the use of nuclear weapons. Don't we need our political and military leaders sometimes to make difficult choices of this kind? Choices to bring about evil in order that a greater good may come. Something like this was the argument of Henry L. Stimson, who had been Truman's Secretary of War, in a remarkable essay that he wrote for Harper's Magazine in 1947. Having laid out the history behind his advice to display the power of atomic weaponry by a direct attack on Japanese cities, Stinson accuses those who would criticize his decision of a kind of blindness to the realities of war. Stinson wrote, the face of war is the face of death. Death is an inevitable part of every order that a wartime leader gives. The decision to use the atomic bomb was a decision that brought death to over 100,000 Japanese. No explanation can change that fact, and I do not wish to gloss it over. But this deliberate, premeditated destruction was our least abhorrent choice. The destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki put an end to the Japanese war. It stopped the fire raids and the strangling blockade. It ended the ghastly specter of a clash of great land armies. There's much that could be said about this argument, including, for example, the revealing use of brought death as an alternative to murdered. Here I will comment on just two things. First, the false conception of what we sometimes have to do that's required for this kind of argument to get off the ground. And second, the crudely simplified version of the historical facts that is presupposed in Stinson's insistence that theirs was our least abhorrent choice. A third thing that could be discussed, but that I'll leave aside due to lack of time and expertise, concerns whether the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki really were the crucial events that put an end to the Japanese war. My understanding, though I am no expert, is that many scholars think they were not, and that the linchpin was rather the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. I'm going to make these two points. I want to say the first one, the point I'm going to make about um, this conception of what we sometimes have to do, I owe to my doctoral student, Marshall Beerson. And the second point about the historical facts, I'm greatly indebted to my colleague, Mark Suva, with whom I've written some about this topic. So my first topic is the conception of moral demands that underlies an argument like Stinson's. There are, of course, some situations in which we have to do a given thing despite the deep desire not to, or despite the undesirable consequences of doing it, or despite the fact that it's the kind of thing we shouldn't do in general. Anscombe's 1978 paper, Rules, Rights, and Promises, gives a nice example of this. Suppose you go to move something, and the thing you need to move is supporting a shelf. So I may say to you that you can't move that. The shelf will fall down. And if I say this, it will be sensible, if perhaps false, for you to reply that nevertheless, you need to move the thing, even if it means bringing down the shelf, given the importance of what you're trying to achieve. That is a situation we can be in, of needing to do something, even in the face of what usually would be very good reasons not to do it. But a statement like, you can't kill them, it would be an act of murder, does not give what is merely a very powerful reason not to kill the people. Since the force of the statement is to say that to kill them would be to murder, 
And so it is the kind of act that is supposed to be on those very grounds excluded altogether from consideration. So the difference here is like the difference between you can't move your queen there, your opponent will be able to capture your rook. It's a bad idea, it will have a bad consequence. And you can't move your queen there, it will put your king in check. It's a move that is illegal. Both said to a novice chess player. In the first case, the can't speaks of the necessity of not doing a certain thing, given that you have the aim of protecting your rook. In the second, the necessity is absolute and unqualified. It says that the move in question is ruled out according to the game you are playing. So there's no sense in replying, yes, I know it will put my king in check, but it's the best way I have to shore up my position. Putting your king in check isn't a consequence you seek to avoid when you play chess. Rather, it's something you simply can't do on your own move insofar as you are playing chess according to the rules. And so it is with the moral law. Whereas it makes sense to weigh the goodness of getting the thing you are reaching for against the badness of causing the shelf to fall down, or the advantage of shoring up your position against the disadvantage of possibly losing a rook, that you commit an act of murder is not an undesired consequence to which you can compare the balance of lives that would be saved by doing it in order to determine whether you ought to do it in this case. If murder is unlawful, then it means it is something you simply can't do any more than you can move your king into check in a game of chess. That law remains in place even if it's an awfully inconvenient one to follow. This brings us to the second point, which concerns the danger of depicting the moral life as a series of decontextualized choices between strictly fixed options with the outcome of each one guaranteed in advance. On this way of thinking about the moral life, the options are fixed, the outcome's guaranteed. And so missing is any role for creative practical thinking, what the scholastics called prudentia, in reasoning through the possibilities and determining how to act also missing the importance of considering how we got here, what the decisions are that we and others made to land us in a morally challenging situation. In the case at issue, these twin failures are on display in the way that first, Truman is depicted as having had no choice other than to bomb Japanese cities if he wished to avoid a protracted ground war. And second, no attention is paid to the way that the terms outlined in the Potsdam Declaration of 1945, specifically the demand that the Japanese government proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces, lest they otherwise face prompt and utter, prompt and utter destruction. That these terms themselves were a major contributor to Japanese intransigence. Stinson himself had recommended different terms to Truman. Anscombe highlighted the latter failure in her pamphlet, Mr. Truman's Degree, writing that in her view, it was the insistence on unconditional surrender that was the root of all evil. And clearly she was right about this much. Other terms of peace were conceivable, and the demand for unconditional surrender only strengthened the Japanese resolve to continue fighting. Indeed, the historian Suyoshi Hasegawa contends that many of Truman's military and civilian advisors preferred alternative peace terms than the ones Truman insisted on. And if Truman had simply followed their advice, Japan may have been willing to surrender much sooner. Further, the description of Truman as having had no choice Simply, obscure, simply ignores the alternative courses of action that were available to the US military, even if they held fast to the unjust demand for unconditional surrender. If the purpose of the bombings was to shock or terrify the Japanese into surrender, then Truman could have chosen to demonstrate the power of the atomic bomb in some other way, perhaps by dropping it on, an, on a non-inhabited target in the ocean near Tokyo. 
Indeed, the idea of such a demonstration was proposed by the very scientists who built the bomb in a memorandum that came to be known as the Frank Report, which was sent to Secretary of War Stinson in 1945, James Frank and others argued that the use of nuclear bombs for an early unannounced attack against Japan was inadvisable. Given the moral and political costs of such an attack, they advised instead that the force of nuclear weapons should be first revealed to the world by a demonstration in, a, in an appropriately selected, uninhabited area. The main reason why this advice was not followed was that they worried that the bomb would be a lemon and nobody would be terrified at all. Even if, in fact, merely demonstrating the power of the bomb would have had a less powerful effect than actually using it to destroy entire cities, anyone committed to upholding the prohibition on killing innocent civilians should recognize this as a superior choice to the one that Truman actually made. I will be the first to say that I am not a historian. But the observation that history is complicated is only more grist for my mill. My argument, and Anscombe's too, has been that it is only in the tales constructed by philosophers that the stakes appear as clear as they need to be for tragic choices to find their supposed justification. Thus, we must kill the one or the five are sure to die, torture the terrorist suspect or the plane is going to be hijacked, lie to the Nazi soldier, or he will certainly find the Jews who are hidden in your basement. By contrast, once we recognize that in real life there is always a wide range of options available to us, and that the consequences of each can never be known fully in advance. This picture of moral judgment as a simple weighing of the consequences collapses. Further, and this is the essential point, I want to suggest that the twin mistakes I have just identified, the mistakes of first pretending that in morally difficult situations our available choices are fixed in a way they simply aren't, Second, of ignoring the choices we made that put us into those situations in the first place. These mistakes are thoroughly bound up with the false view of the moral law as something we sometimes have to violate in light of what may follow from our refusal to do this. For if we do sometimes have to do such a thing as massacre a city full of innocents, then it isn't, after all, the kind of thing we cannot ever do. And with that goes the pressure to find alternatives to murderous acts or to keep ourselves out of situations in which they appear to be demanded of us. Since on this view, what ultimately matters is not that we abide by the law, but rather that we act so as to bring about the best consequences. Earlier, I described how Anscombe's argument against awarding Truman his honorary degree drew considerable international attention. The Collegium Institute's archive of Anscombe's papers at the University of Pennsylvania contains a number of letters she received from people who wrote to criticize or commend her arguments, the most striking of which is from a survivor of the Nagasaki bombing who wrote from a hospital where he was being treated for radiation sickness. You can see the letter is addressed to Miss Gladys, Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe. In his letter, Anscombe's correspondent describes his suffering. For several years after the bombing, I continued to be quite normal, but in 1947, I began to be unwell. I began to suffer from atom bomb sickness, a disease formerly unknown to human experience and I have now been an invalid for nine years. He writes that he had been hospitalized about three months earlier and was expected to stay another three to six months. Upon leaving the hospital, he would have to cover the cost of his own outpatient treatment without any assistance from the decimated Japanese government. The letter to Anscombe continues. Most of us atom bomb sufferers will never get up again. 
or in any case, not in one year or two years. Many are reduced to penury by 10 years of sickness and the expense of treatment in all that time, and suicides of individuals and of whole families increase in number each year. Even if they live, they are a great burden to their families, and they are without hopes and dreams, just like living corpses. Such misery is the present state of those who have the atom bomb sickness. Men like Anscombe's correspondent, like those men, women, and children whose disfigured bodies and faces we see in photographs of the citizens of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the wake of Truman's massacre, are made in the image and likeness of God. And such is the teaching of our church, that we are strictly forbidden to kill an innocent human being, no matter the consequences of such a choice. To conduct a war by murderous means is to call down God's vengeance upon us. To defend such conduct as the correct choice to make from among an artificially limited range of options is to defend the state-sponsored murder of innocence. If God promises vengeance on those who disobey his commands, so does he offer a pledge of his protection when we uphold them. Anscombe recalls this pledge in her 1961 essay, War and Murder, which later she would describe as having been written in a tone of righteous fury about what passed for thinking about the destruction of civilian populations. Sorry to say that it still does so pass. There, Anscombe wrote that as Catholics, we have to fear God and keep his commandments and calculate what is for the best only within the limits of that obedience, knowing that the future is in God's power and that no one can snatch away those whom the Father has given to Christ. To refuse God that obedience is to deny, at least implicitly, that his power over the future is what he promises it to be. In the closing lines of Anscombe's essay, imagine what such a person must be prepared to say to the Lord on the last day. We had to break your law, lest your church fail. We could not obey your commandments, for we did not believe your promises. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot there to think about. It's the tradition of the forum that we begin first with a question from a student, if there is one. Uh, and if you would, please wait for me to bring you the microphone because we're recording and only what makes it into the microphone will be recorded. Hello, uh, thank for answering my question. But uh, I was wondering if um, Anscombe published any writings on wars that happened after World War II, uh, like the Korean War or Vietnam War or any other ones? That's a great question. Um, in the context of war and murder, she's writing about the nuclear arms race, which was left out of my presentation, though actually in the the Frank report, which I cited, is, is primarily about that. Their, their discussion is, we've built this terrible thing. How can we avoid making it be the case that everyone has them and, and is at each other's throats with them? And so the specific context in which that line occurs is one of people saying that we need to build up a store of nuclear weapons now in order to hold off the, the threat of, of Soviet Russia. Um, I can't think of any cases where she weighs in on 
the justice of other specific wars. And I think I would know if there were. She you know, may have thought that she said her piece in, in that particular context. And she did write about any number of other topics in, in um, applied ethics, whether kind of well-known ones like, like capital punishment and euthanasia and abortion and contraception, but also more surprising things like arguing that um, excessive interest on loans is sinful or arguing against the practice of, of simony, which is charging for administering the sacraments. Um, so, so, so she wrote on a range of other topics, but I do think that her reflections on military ethics or war ethics are limited to these two specific contexts, the context of the Second World War and then the context of the nuclear arms race following it. I have a double-barreled question, barrel one. Anscombe writes explicitly in a theological context. Uh, is it possible to defend an absolute prohibition on murder or rape or, any, or torture or anything without uh, these theological appeals? The second question has to do with the argument further down the line. I'm very impressed with the modification of the terms of surrender position. As far as I can tell, and I'm no more historian than you are, if we'd allowed the Japanese to keep their emperor, that would have been enough. And since we did anyway allow the Japanese to keep their emperor, we lost that we would lose nothing. Uh, I, I accept that argument, but it does involve consequentialist reasoning here. You know, we can avoid a bad consequence by doing something else and it won't have bad, it will have negligible, if any, bad consequences of letting them keep the emperor. Letting them keep the emperor, and I mean, consequentialism on that kind of argument, which I think Anscombe hints at, appear, reappears, so to speak, in a subterranean form. Uh, so, I the second barrel of the question is: Is it really possible uh, to get rid of consequentialist reasoning, even if you hold? to absolute prohibitions on murder, rape, torture, or whatever. Great, so I'll take the second half first and then, or take the second parallel first and then go to the other one. Um, you know, there's, there's the line I quoted toward the end that we, we do calculate what is for the best, but we calculate what is for the best within the limits of our obedience to God's law. That's what makes it not consequentialism. Consequentialism doesn't mean thinking about the consequences, but it means thinking about thinking about the consequences within respect for what the moral law demands of us, no matter the consequences. Now, but I further think, and this was one of the points I was trying to make toward the end, is that it's the anti-consequentialist for whom the question, what alternative terms of surrender could there be, becomes the most pressing. The thought is, if you reject the idea that we could annihilate entire cities and so bring the emperor to his knees, then that's off the table. And so then you start to think, well, how can we find peace quickly, even if it means giving up some other things that we want but don't need, right? And I, I think the, the, that kind of reasoning actually fits very well within an anti-consequentialist -conse framework. The first question is one that I find very difficult. And I think that um, certainly at the end, the way that I put, put the argument in terms of trust in the providence of God, right? trust that history is in God's hands and not in ours, um, uh, trust in God's promises that all will be well, puts this defense of moral absolutes into a theological register which is the one where, for me, it, 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 it fits best. I think that if you don't bring them into that register, it's not that I think you, you, you can't have an anti-consequentialist position or an, an absolutist position. It's just that the, the, um, it's harder to defend. But I mean, the idea that we shouldn't 
fill in the blank of, 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 of awful things we might do to one another is, is basic to human consciousness. I mean, the, the, the consequentialist position is, is one that you acquire after tons and tons and tons of abstraction and undermining the, the, the place where you began before you did philosophy. And so I don't, and I think that that reasoning is mistaken and can be resisted before it started. But I do think on the other hand that in these, in these positions where the balance of consequences really is strongly on the side of violating the moral law, and I don't at all mean to deny that there can be such cases, trust in something like divine providence makes it a lot easier to follow the moral law than it would be otherwise. Yes, thank you very much again for your talk. Um, I, 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 and thank you also for pointing out the fact that, uh, you know, that, that unconditional surrender was, was cited by many historians, or the demand for it is a reason for the, uh, ex, uh, the extension of the war. Um, but I wanted, I wanted you to touch upon the issue of the very demand for unconditional surrender of a nation. In its, is it in itself moral or immoral to be? Because bodies politic are things I think willed by God to be the guarantor of their particular, uh, the, the flourishing of a certain people, right? So the people of Japan have a right to their government. The people of Germany have a right to their government. So I'd like you to touch on that issue of, of is it intrinsic, is the demand for unconditional surrender intrinsically vicious. And then also, if you could also touch upon the, uh, whether the demand for conditional, unconditional surrender is related to the demonization of certain peoples, that the designation of, the, of these peoples as intrinsically vicious, the Germans, the Japanese, so on. Thank you. Sure. Um, those are, this is great. Um, you know, one thing I didn't get into in the presentation was that another of Anscombe and Daniels' criticism in their pamphlet of 1939 was over the lack of limited objectives in the war, which is another traditional principle that you conduct a war with limited, with limited objectives. You say that when we do X, Y, Z, the war is going to be done. And, and by contrast, the war wasn't entered into with any specification of, of the objectives. And the, the, the Potsdam Declaration, <laughs> really not a historian, but I mean, the Potsdam Declaration is a fascinating document because it is so incredibly vague on the details. And it was that way purposely, right? There's, there's cases where, you know, they say like, the Japanese will be able to preserve at least these four islands, right? And then there's a natural implication that like, they'll get maybe more. But no, clearly it was just those four. And likewise with, with, with questions of the, um, of the status of the emperor, right? And as I mentioned, Stinson's original draft of the document included Japan being able to retain their emperor, but perhaps under the guise of a, of a constitutional monarchy. Um, certainly a war conducted with unlimited aims is morally problematic. Um, um, certainly specifying or failing to specify the terms of surrender, right? I mean, the, the, the subtext of the Potsdam Declaration is surrender and then we're going to do what we want to you. That's the subtext of the document, right? If you, if you, if you read against the text, <laughs> that's, what, that's what it's saying. And, you know, certainly something like that as, as terms of surrender is, is grossly um, immoral. I guess I would have to think a lot more about this, about this question of, 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 of unconditional surrender and the right of self-governance. Because it does seem like there's a, there's, um, a, a kind of, I don't know, in, the internationalist version of the imperialist project <laughs> is at work in the way the Japanese are being approached in, in 1945. And that, that's certainly inimical to the, the idea that, that, that there's a basic right of self-governance. But I would have to think more about this because I, I think it's, that's an incredibly interesting question, or, or incredibly interesting suggestion, so thanks. Hi, thank you for speaking today. Um, so obviously, Anscombe didn't have a lot of support from her colleagues, but did she face any career repercussions after the publishing of Mr. Truman's degree? That's a great question. Um, I think that, um, 
I mean, Oxford was a small place and kind of is a small place in a way. And so, and there's plenty of like petty rivalry among faculty. And so my sense is that she didn't, there were many of her colleagues at Oxford whom she didn't get along with well. But there are many possible explanations of why she wouldn't have gotten along with them well. She was a student of Wittgenstein's, and Wittgenstein was a Cambridge character and already kind of suspicious. She was a Catholic. She was a woman. She had seven children. Apparently, their home life was just a riot. There's, a, there's an essay written by someone who lived across the street from them that, didn't, that doesn't identify the family by name, but it's clear that he's talking about the Geeches and who talks about loud music coming from the windows, and they would like leave poop on your doorstep. And once he like went and rang the doorbell, and one of the daughters answered, and you know, he's like, you turn the music down, and she said, I, ah, you know, no. And like, you know, then don't worry, the police have come, and they haven't been able to get us to stop doing it either. There's countless reasons why she might not have gotten along with her colleagues, right? But it's a fact that a lot of them had been involved in the war effort, right? I mean, another really interesting part of the history here is that, the, and, and others can tell this history better than I can, but the men were off at war, and that was when this group of women philosophers, Elizabeth Anscombe and Philippa Foote and others, rose in, in the vacuum created by these men being gone, and now they come back, and, and this is one of the things that they encounter. So I think career repercussions, I mean, there was no Twitter mob to go after her, and there was no, like, university disciplinary process for her to face. And her work was obviously unbelievably brilliant. But I do think that her, especially in Oxford, my sense is that she supervised way fewer people than you would expect. Um, and, and that was because she wasn't like the center of Oxford life right, in a way that someone like John Austin was. But again, whether that's because of this particular stance or just because of her being a woman or, or because of any number of aspects of her personality and her, and her private life, I can't really speak to that question. Um, there's a um, methodological point in the talk that I found really interesting, and you've kind of mentioned it a couple times in the Q&A session too, so I wanted to hear more about what you think about it. So it seems like you've said at certain points um, there's a certain way of doing moral philosophy that relies on using so these abstract scenarios, fixes a number of parameters, and then we're supposed to derive some consequence or moral decision by thinking about sort of our intuitive reactions of these kind of constrained cases. It seems like there's something useful about that sort of procedure. Uh, that seems similar to the way that we use model systems in neuroscience. So I think we can learn something useful about brain structure by looking at drosophilia or mouse neurons, even though they don't tell us the whole story, and nobody pretends that they do. And it seems like the same could be said for these sorts of vignettes, right? They're just model systems for decision making. They abstract away from some of the details that, and that helps us control some of the messiness. And we can use that to inform our moral decision making, but it, sh but it shouldn't replace it. So an analogy that comes to mind is something like, you know, if you have training in cooking and then you know a little bit of chemistry, that greatly enhances your ability to cook. But it doesn't mean that you can just go out and get a PhD in chemistry and now you're fit to open a restaurant or something like that. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about why you think that uh, I don't know, methodological um, approach uh, is useless. Great. I mean, yeah, useless would be stronger than I want, uh, um, or at least than I would want to claim right now. I might want it. Um, I want to, but I'm not ready to. Um, but look, I mean, I, I really like the, I really like the parallel with model systems, say, in neuroscience. But, I mean, what's actually really interesting about the cases at issue is that the model systems are real-life neurological systems, right? 
that, 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 that have a real complexity, though less complexity than, you know, than, than say, the human brain. And so, I, the, you know, the question for me is, I mean, put, put another way, like, I, I don't know what's the advantage of considering fictionalized Truman, where the Japanese really weren't going to give in no matter what, and, and where, you know, the, the Soviets weren't invading Manchuria, and where the Japanese really did, the leadership really did find out that the bomb was so bad, even though apparently they were lied to, it didn't, like, like, fictionalized Truman. Okay, we could think about fictionalized Truman, and then we could think about real Truman. And it seems to me like we learn a lot more about the moral life from looking at real Truman than about fictionalized Truman. I mean, we learn that in the moral life, we do have to make hard choices, right? But what we learn is that the options aren't totally settled in advance, or the, the, the consequences aren't fully known in advance. And what we learn is there are different alternatives available to us. And so I'm not sure how, so I mean, that would be the, the, the fodder <laughs> for an argument that somehow, it would be like if you made your model system in neuroscience like, you know, two nodes in a neural network or something. I mean, I take that part of what's, 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 you know, in a computer simulation neural network. Part of what's really nice, I meant to say, about, about these model systems is that they're real nervous systems of real organisms. Um, and so they give us the friction that the real gives us. And likewise, real life situations, even with some of the even with some of the details abstracted, give us that kind of friction that help us think about our real lives more productively. That would be how I'd want to argue. I have to think a lot more about it. I think it's a super interesting question. We have time for just one more question this afternoon. Before the last question, let me remind you that uh, today's event will be followed by a reception in the great room. I really uh, invite all of you to join us to continue the conversation and to um, think more with us about these complicated questions. And our last question. So thank you, Dr. Schwinkley, very much for, for coming, as others have said. And I'm a, a professor in the philosophy department myself, so I, I really appreciated the way that you intertwine the philosophical ideas, positions, and arguments with the real life business that Elizabeth Hanscom was going through. We sort of forget that as philosophers sometimes, that these are really flesh and blood people who are motivated by all sorts of real world concerns, and some of them actually very dramatic and pressing real world concerns. So I really appreciated the way you did that. Um, a question not necessarily for your presentation of Anscombe, but more for the kind of moral philosophy that Anscombe does, and I'm, I'm hoping that you can marshal some resources to defend her against this criticism, which is the criticism of moral systems that are based on intentions. And the criticism that comes from, let's say, moral psychology would be something like this, that the two unstated premises of any adjudication of a moral position on the basis of intentionality, one is that the intentions can be stated propositionally, right, in terms of concepts that relate to each other so that we can adjudicate their rational viability, we can adjudicate whether they're consistent, coherent, we can adjudicate all sorts of things only if their propositional content so intentionality, and excuse me, intentions always have rational, um, sort of an undergirding. I, I'm not saying that correctly, sorry. <laughs> but the second one is not only that uh, intentions have rational content, but second, that that rational content is transparent. Right? Going back to a Cartesian example where we actually do know what's going on in our heads when we make decisions. Uh, it seems to me that people like Schopenhauer, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, people like certainly Freud are going to say that we actually don't really know why it is we do the things that we do. And if we did know why we do the things that we do, it seems like the entire business of psychology would be out of business in 30 seconds, right? We need trained people to actually tell us why it is we're doing what we're doing. So if that's a criticism that intentionalists don't sort of live up to the psychological complexity, much of which is unknown to the agent and much of which can't be put into a sort of rational proposition, then how do we sort of use intentionality to adjudicate complex moral situations? Great. Um, 
I think that so part of the answer is 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 in distinguish is in following Anscombe and distinguishing two sen two senses in which why can be asked, right? So you know if 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 you stand up and go into the great room and I ask why are you going in there or what are you doing? You're saying I'm going to get something to eat. I mean, the idea that 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 that's not the intention or an intention with which you're going into the great room would be absurd. I mean, of course, and of course you know that much. Nothing in psychology suggests that I don't know that I'm going in to get something to eat. What it suggests is two things. F first of all, that there might be things, that there might be causes of my being so motivated that I'm not aware of, right? What's with your fixation on food, right? Where did that come from, right? And it might turn out that there's some, right? But also, it also suggests that, that often there are, that some of our further intentions, especially ones that are more distant from us, are unknown, right? And I, and I don't d deny that that's, um, uh, that that's real. I'm not sure that we needed psychology to teach it to us, right? I think Augustine thought that, for example. Um, um, but uh, <laughs> Jane Austen clearly thought it, um, to pick two people on the windows from the great room. Um, but... Um, um, I, I mean, I, I think enough moral philosophy can be done with the intentions that are self-known for at least a lot of it to be done well. I mean, whether Truman was motivated by a deep desire to, you know, avenge an, an unhappy childhood or something like this, right? <laughs> the, the kind of Freudian explanation you might give Right, is in some way relevant to our understanding Truman, right? but doesn't at all bear on the question of whether the deaths of the civilians was a means he took to the end of ending the war. Right? And, and that, that realm of basic instrumental means and reasoning is the kind of thing where I think the, the rational interlocking that you're describing is, is the most prevalent and also, is, and also is to a great extent, as you say, transparently self-known to us. I mean, we know in, that, in this basic arena what we're doing and why, just like our visual perception gives us good enough knowledge of what things look like in the room around us, even if it can't reveal subatomic particles or the nature of the stars. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Please join me in thanking Professor Schwenkler.